liar. Good morning, church. Boy, it is good to see you today. We are so glad that you're here to worship the Lord with us. This is a very, very momentous day in the life and in the history of our church. We'll be breaking ground at the end of the service, at the end of the second service, over at our new uh, the, the the parking lot right across for the to begin the process of construction of a new building, and um, and so let me I'll uh, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But just want to welcome you. I know we've got guests worshiping with us, and we are so honored. And I don't know if you knew that this was a special day or just happened to be here on this day, but but uh, but we welcome you. We're glad you're here if you're a guest, and we would be really grateful if you would let us know that you're here. And it's real simple. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you and you just pull that out fill it out there's two ways you can get it to us you can either put it in the offering box in the back or the better option is take it to the welcome center at the end of the service because they're going to have a gift there for you in exchange for that card so we just want you to know we're glad you're here um, several announcements in the bulletin want to want to highlight we're just going to be able to highlight what what's happening this week and next sunday uh, so there'll be other announcements, but we're not going to we're not going to you know take time on those because we've got a lot to do this morning. Um, so first of all, WOM uh, Women on Mission, y'all are meeting this week on Wednesday, so make note of that. Men's breakfast is Saturday, so guys, make note of that. And then next Sunday we're having a baptism, and uh, right now. You know, we don't have anybody that we're baptizing in the service, and I don't like that. I like baptizing in both services. We've got a slew of people being baptized in the second service. We always give them the choice what service to be baptized. So if you know somebody, if you need to be baptized, or even if you don't, just let us know. We'll baptize you again, okay? You know, um, we're, not, we're not above that. And so uh, anyway, I, I'd love for somebody uh, that, that we know in this service to be baptized. And so, uh, but, but be here, I think. I'm believing that by next Sunday, we'll have somebody in this service going to be baptized. So anyway, it'll be a very special occasion. And then the Super Bowl stuff, you know, the flag football. Our students make a big deal out of this, and, and it's a lot of fun. We go to, to um, oh, what's the park we go to? Wallace Riddell. <laughs> Wallace Riddell. Woohoo! Oh, it's up on the board. All I had to do is look, you know. <laughs> the... <laughs> Duh. I was wondering, you guys are way too smart this morning, okay? You can read. And so that was just a test, you know. And so it's a, just a great time. It's a, we take a picnic lunch. We have play flag football, you know, and it's just a lot of fun. And there's, they're gonna, there's gonna be multiple games, okay? So adults and then games for youth. And so we'll have multiple games. So if you wanna play, we'll have a place for you. And so wanted you to be aware of that. Then other announcements that you're not gonna spend time on. Next Sunday... This parking lot is liable to be fenced off. Now, we don't know exactly when they're going to put the fencing up, okay? But because of that, that's obviously 90, 95% of our parking. And so because of that, we made this short video. Many of you saw it last week. We didn't make another one, but we wanted to reshow it because we know some of you perhaps weren't here last week. A little video we made about alternate parking, okay? So here it is. Good morning, church. Well, I'm going to take you on a little tour of our alternative parking. I'm so excited about what the Lord is doing in our church, and it, of course, is going to require a little patience on all of our parts, but, uh, but I know it's going to work great, and, uh, and I think you'll see in this short video. I do want to uh, caution you about parking in the Church of Christ parking lot. Please, they are already stressed for parking themselves, so please be courteous and, and stay on our parking. And so I'm going to begin. Obviously, I'm right here in front of the worship center. The parking right across from the worship center is reserved for handicapped, guests, and those with mobility issues. So please, if you don't fall into either one of those three categories, please, please be sensitive about that and park. So we're pulling out onto Vanderveer, and uh, you'll recognize it as, as we go. Uh, worship center on the right, Family Life Center. We're on Vanderveer. Now we're at the corner of Vanderveer and Washington. This, of course, is where our new building is going to be. And so all of this uh, parking area is going to be fenced off. So you won't have any access uh, to that at all. There will be probably some parking here at the office uh, and perhaps across the street at the old office, the Rock Building. Uh, you'll see some parking here behind the office as well. So I'm at Jackson and Vandeveer, and I'm going to turn right here. This is going to be our one of our primary sources of parking right here. 
there is approximately 50 parking places and uh, so we can uh, we'll be able to park here and we'll have a shuttle coming by here not only to pick you up and take you to the worship center but also to bring you back to your car after the service is over and right up here will be a second municipal parking area that we will certainly have access to many parking places here again shuttle bus will be coming by here uh, both before and after the services and after sunday school so you'll have plenty of opportunity so we're at the square here at pierce and jackson i'm going to turn right the whole square we have access to there is a church that meets at trailblazers we don't know exactly how many parking places that they require but we're going to be very sensitive to that but the whole square basically you'll be able to park we're going to have a shuttle bus coming to the square before the service after the service and so uh, there should be very very handy parking again i'm turning back on to washington i do want to caution you about parking at first state bank parking lot because the presbyterian church utilizes that and we want to certainly be sensitive to them and not um, occupy parking that they're typically uh, using. And then on my right, of course, our, our worship center is here on my left, Family Life Center right here. I'm turning on an alleyway, and if you'll notice, there's a lot of parking on this alley. There's probably 20 to 30 parking spots along this alley. And so uh, this will be, uh, again, some area where we can park that's relatively close and very accessible. And so uh, uh, I think there, as you can see, there's a lot of alternative parking. And I just want to thank you again in advance for your patience. And uh, we may need to make some adjustments, do a little tweaking as we go, but we're going to make it as easy as possible for everybody to park and everybody to be able to get to the worship center safely. So thank you again for your patience. God bless you. It's exciting times at First Baptist Church of Burnett. Amen. Oh, boy, it's terrible to look at yourself and your receding hairline. Oh, 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 man, that was a reality check. So we've also got a slide we want to show you real quickly of kind of where the shuttle pickups are going to be. Okay, so this is 29, and this is uh, Van, uh, Vanderbilt right here. So church is right here, and this is the municipal parking that we talked about. There's a shuttle stop right there in the middle of that parking lot. And then this is the other municipal parking that we looked at. Shuttle stop right there. And then this is the square, obviously. Shuttle stop here, shuttle stop here. And then we'll drop you off right here at the door. And so it, you're liable to, to walk less than you're having to walk right now. Um, I don't know that they're going to fence this parking lot off this week. I suspect they will. If they don't, they're going to start work. Park there as long as you can, okay, but, but the Sunday you get here and it's not, we'll have the shuttles going, and so just I want you to, to know that we're doing everything that we can do to make this as uh, easy as possible, and so, you know, just um, wanted to, to pause just a moment in the, in the trophy case in the back, there are, <clears throat> I get a little emotional thinking about this, there are three golden shovels, one for this building, and there's one for the Family Life Center, and there's one for the new office, okay? Uh, come Monday or come this afternoon, there's going to be a fourth golden shovel in there, okay? <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. And, and uh, so, so this shovel will be here until Jesus comes, okay? And uh, as, as will the other three. And so this is a, a, a momentous occasion. This doesn't happen very often, um, the uh, this built the 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 the, the, wor the first the first worship center was about right there where the back half of the this worship center is okay that one was replaced in 1949 with the building next to us okay and then that building was built in 1949 and then in 1980 this building was begun and was occupied and dedicated in 1983 and so about every 40 years you can see the 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 process and so uh, we'll be dedicating that building sometime in 2025 and so 42 years after uh, this building was built. This building was built 39 years after the worship center right next to us was built. And so it doesn't happen very often. And we have the privilege of being a part of making history, not only for Burnett, but uh, obviously for First Baptist Church. And so uh, I want to encourage you, if at all possible, to stay. It'll be right there. You saw where it was taped off this morning. That'll be where the groundbreaking is. And, and encourage you 
please stay. And if you're not staying for Sunday school, hopefully you will stay for Sunday school, and then it'll just be right after Sunday school for you. But if you don't stay for Sunday school, come back and be a part of that uh, historical uh, event uh, of the groundbreaking uh, across the corner. So anyway, we're glad you're here, and we're here to worship the Lord, not build buildings. And so we can't ever lose sight of that. So, so let's begin to worship the Lord. Let me lead us in prayer as we, as we begin our service today. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity of knowing you. And you know my heart on buildings. I don't like them. They're too expensive, and they... They're, they take a lot of effort, a lot of time to plan and to build, and, but Lord, we know it's necessary. We know that we're a growing congregation. We know that our facilities, many of them, much of our facility is, is outdated. We know that this facility is, is relatively uh, good, but we know that the rest of it's not, and so we've, over the last four and a half, five years, have been talking about this and praying about this, and the day has come <clears throat> to begin. We're doing it for your glory and for your honor. We're doing it because we feel like you told us to do it. Um, And so we are confident that you're going to bless it and that you're going to use uh, what we do today to bless generations to come until you return, Jesus. And so we're honored to be a part of this historical event. And we just uh, want to bless you. We want to honor you. We're going to sing to you. We're going to study your word. We welcome you here and we ask you to speak to us by your Holy Spirit and give us ears to hear what your spirit says to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing this together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that say a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace was grace was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Oh 
think you'll know it. If you don't, you're going to learn it. It goes like this. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and he died for me. I see Transcend. 
going to sing that again. Amen. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. And thou will rise among the saints. Thy gaze transfigured. started the service this morning, a cappella. I just want to hear the voices sing it out. Oh, praise the name. Father, this morning as we, uh, we're just here in your presence. God, we know you are inhabiting this place. We're meeting in, in your powerful, mighty name, Lord. We, we love you this morning. We are so thankful for the direction that you're giving this church, this church body. We're thankful for everything that you're doing in the lives of our church family, the healing, the comfort protection and God we just ask for just an incredible protection as that fence goes up around our building where we ask for a hedge of protection around this church family Lord may, may we honor you in everything that we do in Jesus name I pray amen you may be seated You don't know how good it feels to be able to sing with your grandkids.
with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away and we'll enjoy all the beauty where all things are new I want to stroll And we'll meet all our loved ones And we'll see Jesus too That will be a glad reunion There will be much to view When I stroll over heaven with you I hope to stroll Troubles and heartaches are vanished away. Then we'll enjoy all the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. I want to stroll. Jack, Shelby, Kara, thank you for leading us in worship. You know, it's so funny that you sang that song. Um, whenever the, the conversation between me and the Lord began about, um, about uh, building a new building, you know, I said, you know, Lord, you're coming back soon, so why do we need another building? And I said, you know, my greatest fear is that we're going to get this building just done, you know, and the Sunday before we move in, Jesus is going to come back, you know, <laughs> and he said, why don't you let me worry about that, okay, and, uh, but boy, that's what we have to look forward to, we're going to stroll all over heaven with Jesus and with those we know and love who have gone before us, and uh, so thank you, Jack and Shelby and Kara for reminding us of that, one of the greatest uh, promises in scripture. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. I've really second guessed myself on this. We began this series. I, I, I say series, series within a series. We're looking at verse 3 through 13, and we began this two weeks ago. And I thought for sure I could get it done. I thought maybe I could get it done in one, but then it became very apparent it was going to take at least two. And now we're on our third uh, message in this, um, in this passage. And we started with two questions. You know, one is if, if you were to tell somebody that you were a believer and they said, prove it, what would you say? How would you prove that you were a follower of Jesus? How would you commend yourself to them? And we saw that Paul is commending himself. Many in Corinth thought that he was, maybe had impure motives. Uh, maybe he wasn't as sincere or genuine as he, as he uh, presented himself to be. So they were questioning that. And he uh, in, in our passage, commended himself. And he did that by using more than 30 qualities, 30 things that he did, 30 things about his character that commended, that proved that he was genuine. And so that's what we're talking about. We've, I, I grouped them into, into 12, okay, and we looked at the first five the first week, and then we only looked at two last week, which is where we kind of bogged down. And so we're going to get through this thing today, okay, for better or for worse, uh, in sickness and in health until death we do part, okay? We're going to get through this today. And the, the real problem is going to be in the second service. i got to do it quickly so that we can have time for our groundbreaking. So fasten your seatbelts. Keep your arms and legs inside the ride, okay? We're going to look at the, the final five today um, of, of proving we are genuine, these qualities that, that prove that we're a follower of Jesus. So uh, let me remind you of the first seven. Brent, you can put these up as we go. Uh, the first one was we prove that we're genuine by not causing others to stumble. Number two, we prove that we're genuine by enduring difficult circumstances and how we endure those. Number three, by 
Or they call, they're call, all coming up at the same time. Okay, number three, by enduring persecution and how we endure that. By hard work, we prove that we're genuine by hard work. In our relationships, uh, number five, by the presence of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit that comes uh, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And then number seven, by our integrity, okay? These three things are, are in, the, in the verses prior to what we're going to start today. And we're going to look at the, the next ones today. Uh, and I'll introduce those as we get to them. So, let me read it. I'm going to read all the uh, verses again. This is the third week we've read this passage, but I think it's significant because, like I said, over 30 things he mentions here uh, that he does to commend himself to the church at Corinth. Verse 3 of chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 6, 3. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. So that's the theme. We commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and then here's where we're going to pick up, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, Poor, yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Woo, I love that. Having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak on my, as, as to my children, open wide your heart also. Let me lead us in prayer. Holy Spirit, we know that you're our teacher. So we ask you to give us ears to hear what you say to us uh, this morning as we, as, we, as we find out how Paul proved and how we can prove that we are genuine followers of you, genuine children of God. And Jesus, it's in your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're on number eight. <laughs> Excuse me, I got a little congested this morning. I may cough a few times, but number eight, in spiritual warfare, in spiritual warfare. Now, he kind of <clears throat> he kind of alludes to it here in verse uh, seven. He says, "In truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Weapons of righteousness. Weapons." implies battle, okay? And we'll talk about that. The scriptures are full of passages talking about spiritual warfare. The first one here I want to look at is in our the book, 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's probably on the next page for you. Just flip over there real quick, and I want us to look. Now, we're going to, we're going to have a whole message on, on this passage here, one of the most powerful passages in, in, in the reality of spiritual warfare. But look at what it says in verses uh, 4 and 5, and, and you'll read it. It's not going to be up on the screen. It says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. We pay attention to what we're thinking about, and we take those thoughts captive and make sure that they're pleasing to Jesus. Make sure they're making Jesus smile and not frown. And so that's the first place that we find. I mean, there's other passages, Ephesians 6, 12, and this will be up on the screen. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Ours or other people's, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil. That's spiritual warfare. That's demons that we battle with that try to talk us into disobeying Jesus. Against spiritual powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're not talking about evil people that are around us. We're talking about evil forces in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, stand. So then right after that is the, is the, the armor of God that's listed. And so it talks a lot about spiritual warfare in the Bible. You know, that's important because, you know, I was listening to a preacher not long ago, a very well-known preacher. 
okay, from a different background. And he said, oh, we know that there's no such thing as demons, you know. And, and I know Jesus talked about it, but he was, he was making concessions for the, for the superstitions of the people of his day. I nearly fell over. You could have blown me over with a feather. I couldn't believe. I mean, you talk, about, you talk about taking away the authority of Scripture. You're just saying so much of the Bible, it's not true. It's just, super, you know, just superstition. Jesus is just kind of going along, you know. Holy cow, I don't believe that. I hope you don't either, you know. The fact of the matter is I had a professor in a Baptist university who did not believe in demons. And he taught that openly to his classes, you know. I was there. Boy, we argued with him day after day. And he just, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. And I'm going, what do you do with Scripture? What do you do with Ephesians six twelve? And he said the same thing, basically. Oh, that was just Jesus making concessions, you know. For the superstitions of the, of the people. Uh, another passage is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Look at what it says here. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Well, he's a roaring lion. And if we're not paying attention to him, we're ignoring him, then lo and behold, he's going to take advantage of us. I promise you. I wonder how much of what we struggle with in life has spiritual origins. It's a spiritual force of wickedness making a suggestion to us. Hey, why don't you do this? Oh, you don't have to do that. Hey, why don't you do this? Everybody else is. It'll be fun. It'll feel good, you know. How many of those... Are, are spiritual forces of wickedness, and uh, I suspect a lot more than what we think, okay? Jesus even addresses it. Um, he, was, he had just cast a demon out of a blind man who was also a mute, okay? And, uh, and he was questioned about that. They say, man, it's by the power of the devil that he's casting out demons. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. It says, but if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, this is Jesus talking, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You remember, that's what he said. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was his first sermon. He said, man, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions? The strong man here is the devil. He just cast him out of this man carry off his possession unless he first tie up the strong man then he can rob his house and so what he's saying is you got to bind the strong man you got to tie up the devil you got to tie up that spiritual force of wickedness before you can take that person from their possession okay that's what he's talking about and over and over and over i didn't i didn't count i probably should have how many times did jesus cast out a demon over and over and over and over Okay, And so we have to understand Ephesians 6.12 is, is true. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And how we do that spiritual warfare proves that we're genuine followers of Jesus because that's what he did. He came, he said, to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he came back. And so as followers of his, we're going to do the same thing. Number nine, regardless of recognition, regardless of recognition. Now, we prove we're genuine when we continue to serve, whether we're recognized or not. That's what he's talking about. In the first part of verse eight, if you want to look at it, he says, through glory and dishonor. Sometimes what he did resulted in glory. Sometimes it resulted in dishonor for him, Okay. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't honor him. In bad report and in good report. Sometimes he did something and people reported badly about it. Sometimes he did something and people reported good, good about it. Uh, but we just have to realize that sometimes you're going to be honored for what you do and sometimes you won't. That's just the reality of it. You know, it's funny, as a pastor, I hesitate to start naming names. You know, if I start thanking somebody for doing something, then everybody else is going to be saying, why don't you thank me for what I'm doing, you know? That's my fear, you know, or I'll leave the name out. or so. And so as a church, we hesitate to do that because, because some people, they don't want to serve unless they're going to be recognized, unless they're going to get a pat on the back or a standing ovation or whatever. And, and Paul said, I don't, I don't care about all that stuff. I'm going to serve whether I get recognized or not. And that needs to be every one of our hearts. Sometimes there's going to be a good report about what we do. Sometimes there's going to be a bad report about what we do. You know, as the, in the five years we've been planning this building, there's been good things said and there's been bad things said about that. Oh, we don't need it. Oh, it's, it's, it's premature. You know, just on and on about it. But you just ultimately, 
You just have to say, you know, Jesus, what do you want? Okay? And we have to just live for him and just uh, depend on the recognition from him. In fact, that's what he said. He said, don't do it for anybody but the Lord. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 says this, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So we don't do anything that we do for recognition. And if we get recognition, wonderful. We say thank you and we're very gracious about that. If we don't get recognition, we just go on and we keep our nose to the grindstone and we keep doing what Jesus tells us to do. We keep doing the next thing Jesus tells us to do, whether we're recognized or not. And that proves that we're genuine. If we require recognition then maybe we're doing it for the applause of other people or for the recognition of other people. And when we do it, regardless of recognition, boy, we prove that we're genuine. Number 10, regardless of perception. Regardless of perception. In the second half of verse 8, he says this, genuine yet regarded as impostors. Some people thought Paul was genuine. Some thought he was an imposter. That he was a false prophet, a false apostle, okay? But he kept serving the Lord, known and yet regarded as unknown. Paul was very well known, but, but he'd come to some place and they'd go, Paul who? Paul who, you know? Like they didn't know him. And so it didn't matter what the perception of other people was. He was going to serve Jesus, he was going to be in touch with Jesus, and he was going to do what Jesus told him to do. You know, people will perceive us different. Some will think we're genuine. Some will think we're not, you know. Some will question our motives. Some, they won't question our motives. To some, we're going to be a hero. To others, we're going to be a heel. And that's just the reality of the world we live in, you know. It's interesting because on occasion, you know, things will get back to me about things that are said about me. In fact, 10 years ago, when this search committee was, was talking to me about becoming, 11 years ago, about becoming the pastor here, they called somebody and they said, that man should never be in ministry. That's what they said. Well, the, the search committee had to pray and discern, okay, Jesus, we got this bad report about Doug. Should we consider him as our pastor? And the Lord said, absolutely, yes. And the rest is history. The rest is, and so, so you got to understand, people are not always going to talk good about you or positive about you, okay? But what you do in response to that proves whether you were genuine. I just said, Jesus, do you want me to be the pastor of First Baptist Church? And he said, absolutely. Many other people, everybody in the church, except I think there were, there were two, you know, of the final vote said, yes, we believe that's what Jesus is saying. And look at what he's done. Look at the people who have been saved. Look at the people who have joined. Look at what the Lord is doing, okay? You know, just keep serving regardless of people's perception. You're not living your life for them. You're living your life for him, okay? And keep living it for him. Do the next thing that he tells you to do and keep on doing it regardless of how you're perceived. Live your life for an audience of one. There's only one person that needs to be smiling at the end of the day, and that's Jesus. And if he's smiling, it doesn't matter if anybody else is smiling or not, okay? Regardless of perception, and when you keep doing what Jesus is telling you to do, regardless of how you're being perceived, that proves you're genuine. That proves you're genuine. That's how you commend yourself. Number 11, by living intention. Now, this is interesting. We're going to spend a little time uh, walking around on this one. Living intention. Paul mentions five dichotomies, five things that are completely opposite for e from each other and yet still true in the life of a believer. Okay? So, so what, listen carefully. Number one, dying yet we live on. This is verse 9. Dying yet we live on. That's what he says. You know, in a very real sense, when you became a follower of Jesus, you died. Did you know that? In a very real sense. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Look at what it says. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. We interviewed a youth pastor years ago uh, when I was at another congregation as a pastor. And we interviewed him and we said, what is, your, what is your life verse? This was a verse he pointed to, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I want to ask you a question. Have you died for Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, the answer is yes. 
You have died for Jesus. You have been crucified with him, and it's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And you keep claiming that promise over and over and over. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. This is the, this is the passage that we, the reality that we, that, or, or the, the baptism is a picture of our death. Did you know that? Baptism is a burial and a resurrection, it says in Romans 6, 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? Into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. This is the passage I quote every time I baptize somebody. Buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so we've been crucified with Christ and we live this yet we have died and yet we live on Doug I look in the mirror and he's still there (laughs) you know there are days I wish that man it was more obvious the 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 death of Doug and the new reality uh, that that Christ is living in me Jesus says that death is required to be his follower did you know that you got to die to be his follower. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Here it is. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. You see, and as we live that reality... We prove that we're genuine followers of Jesus. But we have to keep reminding ourselves. And Old Doug is dead, new Doug is risen. Old Doug is dead, new Doug has risen. Romans chapter 6 verse 11, look at what it says. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We have to keep reminding ourselves. Man, we have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So dying... Yet we live on. Number two, and we're talking about these dichotomies, these five dichotomies. Beaten and yet not killed. Now, we know that Paul was beaten many times, but he wasn't killed. We know that he was executed by Nero. He was beheaded. But up to this point when he wrote this letter, he'd been beaten many times, and yet he was still living. And we, most, I don't think anybody here in our congregation has been beaten for the cause of Christ. Sometimes we get beaten down, you know, for the cause of Christ. But we know in other countries that people literally are beaten and even executed because of their faith in Jesus. And we pray for them and we're committed to supporting them every way that we can. But how does it apply to us? Well, we get beaten down and yet we uh, live on. We're not, we're not killed. We've got to remember what our mom said. You remember what mom said? Sticks, you can stay with sticks and stones will break your bones, but what words will never hurt you. And we know that words hurt, okay, but they don't threaten our lives they don't bruise and and cause bruises cuts and abrasions um, and we don't die from words that people speak and so we have to just understand man sometimes sometimes we're persecuted as we looked at last week sometimes we're persecuted but man we're never defeated and we're not killed okay so beaten and yet not killed third dichotomy sorrowful yet always rejoicing Sorrowful, he says, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. He says that uh, in, there in verse 9. Um, verse 10, very first part is verse 10. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. You know, it's interesting because I, as I was reflecting on this and talking to the Lord about this and, and the message, and, and um, you know, I thought about the building and, and probably the, the passage I'll talk about the day before we move over there is the day they moved into the new temple temple had been destroyed and they built a new temple and it says that that the people cried they they sobbed they wept they wailed and and there's a little bit of that I know I don't know if if you know the history but I was in this building as a 17 or 18 year old teenager I was watched it being built because my grandfather was the chairman of the building committee that did that and when I was in here uh, none of the finishes were, were done uh, the outside was done and the windows were in, but the baptistry wasn't done. And they were putting the, 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 the fluorescent lights behind that stained glass window. My grandfather was saying, it's not an outside wall. And so a stained glass window, in order to see it, you've got to have light behind it. And so he was describing all that to me. And then we walked out that door around the corner, and that was Pastor Jim's uh, uh, office. So we walked out and we walked around to Pastor Jim's office. I went to his funeral 
about a year and a half ago in Bernie, Texas. He was the one that was the pastor when, when this building was built in 1980. Uh, when that whole process started, they moved in and dedicated it in 1983. And um, I, I've, got a, I've got a lot of memories here. You know, my, my grandmother and grandfather were here in 1970. He was born and raised here in Burnett, but moved away and then moved back in 1973 and were here till 2007 when he passed away. He's the one that, that oversaw the building of this building. <laughs> There's a part of me that, man, when I go to heaven, I'm not looking forward to seeing him. Say, Why'd you tear down my building? <laughs> you know, I'm not looking forward to that. It kind of scares me a little, a little bit. I'm sorrowful. You know, I can't imagine the people who have been married in this building People who've attended dozens and dozens and dozens of funerals of of friends and family here in this building and and people who got saved in this building were baptized in that that baptistry. And I think about how that's heartbreaking, you know? That that makes me sorrowful. And yet, and sometimes we live in that. Bad things happen. Sometimes things make us sad in life, but we are always rejoicing, Always rejoicing. That's what he says. Sorrowful yet always. We live in that dichotomy. We live in that, in that tension, okay, of being sorrowful about some stuff and yet always rejoicing because we know that rejoicing is a discipline. It's something we decide to do. I don't know when I started this practice. I, I wish I could tell you, but I can't. The, today is the best day ever. Literally, I say that every day. Today is the best day ever. And then I live it as though it is. And you know what? The only day better than today is going to be tomorrow if I live to see it. <laughs> because that helps me to rejoice. It's, it's a discipline. If he's, uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command. That's a command to get up on the right side of the bed. Every morning, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, he says. Rejoice, rejoice. Listen, do you, are you a person who rejoices? Is that a discipline you've adopted in your life? I want to challenge you. Life is so much better when you're rejoicing. <laughs> it really is. You can't get depressed when today's the best day ever. You just can't. When you're looking forward to tomorrow, can't wait because the only day better than today is going to be tomorrow, okay? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Um, Joy is mentioned 218 times in the Bible. Did you know that? Joy is mentioned 218 times. Jesus wants us to have his joy. John 15, 11, look at it. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be in you complete. And we live in that dichotomy, even though we experience things that are very sad and very difficult, and we're sorrowful, yet we're always rejoicing. And we live in that dichotomy. He says the fourth one is poor, poor, yet making many rich. Paul was poor. He didn't have much, okay? But he made many, many people rich. Financially, of course not. We're not talking about money. How did he make people rich? Because of the quality of life that he brought to them. Um, uh, I'm skipping some of my notes because I'm running out of time real quick. How did he make people rich? Quality of life. When you give somebody Jesus, you give them everything. When you give somebody Jesus, you give them everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Equals everything. Okay, you give people abundant life, you give people eternal life because that's what Jesus gives us. Number five, having nothing, he says, yet possessing everything. Again, Paul was poor at the same time. He gave gave people everything that mattered because he gave them abundant life. John chapter 10, verse 10, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Jesus is speaking and he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Psalm chapter 23, verse 6, one of our favorite passages in all the Bible, surely goodness and love, many translated mercy, will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's having everything right there. That's having everything. And Paul says, having nothing and yet possessing 
everything. That's our lives as believers. Now, we know that none of us are poor in biblical standards, okay? Okay, but, but we know that as followers of Jesus, oh, man, we possess everything because we have the fruit of the Spirit. You remember the fruit of the Spirit? You remember what it is? Love, joy, peace, patience. It's up there on the screen. I think we've got it back there. Uh, Brent, if Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man, when you got those, huh? You got it all. If you don't have those, guess what? You don't have a thing. You may have all the money in the world. You may be the richest person in Burnett County. But if you don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, you don't have anything. You don't have anything. You're just fighting for another dollar. And you're going to have to give it up when you, all, when you pass away anyway. You know, it breaks my heart to see people who are very wealthy. They don't know Jesus. They died at a very young age. You go, wow. Oh, everything they gave their life for, they just left behind. And now they live in eternity without Jesus because they live without Jesus here. They live without him there, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Did you know that? As a follower of Jesus, you possess everything. You got it all. Everything that matters is yours in Jesus. So by living in this tension, we prove that we're genuine. Okay, number 12, very quickly, by being vulnerable even when others are not. By being vulnerable even when others are not. This is verse 11 through 13 is what it talks about. It says, Paul says, opened wide his heart to the Corinthians. Opened wide his heart to the Corinthians. What does that mean? Well, it means that he was transparent and he was vulnerable. He was transparent and he was vulnerable to the Corinthians. You take a great risk when you do that. When you become transparent, you get real with people, you know. And, and you just open up your heart and you become vulnerable towards them. A lot of people, they won't do that. Man, they're going to stay shut off. They're going to they're gonna protect themselves. They're not going to be transparent. They're not going to be real. They're going to put on a mask. They're going to fake it, you know. A lot of people are that way. But followers of Jesus are called to be transparent. We're called to be real. We're called to be vulnerable to other people, whether they're vulnerable to us or not. He said, Corinthians, they, they didn't open their heart to him at all. He showed them his affection. You know, being vulnerable, being real is, is being willing to show affection. He said, man, I showed you affection, but you haven't shown me any in return. But he's going to continue to do that. Why? Because that proves he's genuine. Proves he's genuine because he loves people and he's affectionate towards people and he's open and he's vulnerable towards people, whether they are to him or not. Okay. I want to ask you, how vulnerable are you? Oh, We've got to be cautious, you know, about, about affection you know, unwanted affection or inappropriate affection or, you know, we got to be careful about those kind of things, a flirtatious kind of attitude. There's no place for that in the kingdom of God, but, but there is uh, room for affection and for vulnerability. How affectionate are you as a person? How affectionate are you towards your children? Your children need hugs from you. They need you to tell them that you love them. Your spouse, they need hugs and kisses from you. you know, I, oh, it's funny. I, 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 Brent and I practice this long hug thing, you know, where I don't just, you know, hug her and, and all, run off. Man, sometimes we'll just, we'll just hug. We'll just stand there and we'll just hug. And I shared that with a friend. He said, ooh. <laughs> He wasn't gonna. He wasn't comfortable with that. But man, I, I've even got a friend, a male friend, who man, he he believes in long hugs. Man, and he just hugs me, and so tight I can hardly breathe. And he just holds me and holds me. And I'm kind of looking around, saying, "Anybody looking?" You know. And uh, how affectionate are you? You know. Uh, how vulnerable are you to other people? How vulnerable you are, and how affectionate you are, in a lot of ways, proves how genuine you are. Okay given, obviously, appropriate boundaries. And so, so I ask you this morning, you know, when we're thinking about proving that we're genuine, oh, man, I've already gone over. Spiritual warfare, okay, affection, regardless of perception, regardless of recognition, by living in this tension, okay, we, we vulnerably serve Jesus in a, in a world that doesn't know him, that doesn't love him, that doesn't trust him. And as we do that, we prove we're genuine. We prove we're sincere. 
And the only one that matters is Jesus. And the only smile that matters is the smile on his face. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're thankful uh, this morning for just the, the, uh, the, the understanding of how we can prove that we're your genuine followers. And we know that that only matters to you ultimately, but, but you know, we want other people to know that we're sincere and genuine as well. And so help us to, to, to do the things that we know to do to make a difference in the world and to put a smile on your face. And Jesus, it's in your name we ask it. Amen. We always sing one last song here in our, in our service, and it's a time of invitation, a time for response. It's a time where we say, okay, Jesus, what are you saying to me? We listen, we pay attention to the voice of God, and then as he speaks to us, we say, yes, sir, I'll do that, or I'll stop doing that, whatever it is that he lays on your heart. And so if you're here and you're not a believer, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, that's the most important thing of all, whether you're a follower of Jesus. Okay, you say, well, how do, I, how do I become a follower of Jesus? It's so simple. You just have to believe two things. Be so convinced of him that you're willing to turn your life over to Jesus. You understand that he loves you and he proved it by dying on the cross for your sins. Do you believe that? When Jesus died on that cross, he paid for Doug's sins. He paid for your sins. You say, well, how do I know that's true? Because he proved that was true by raising from the dead. Jesus came back to life on the third day. He rose from the dead. And that proves that he was who he said he was. And he did what he claimed to have done. And when you're convinced of those things, you're compelled to follow him. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. If you've never been saved, turn your life over to Jesus today. He died for your sins and he rose from the dead and he deserves your loyalty and he deserves your allegiance. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And as we do, you just make the decisions that Jesus lays on your heart this morning. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something about. Man, I hope whenever you say or sing the name of Jesus that you know in your heart there is something special about that name. If you made a decision for the first time, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, to follow Jesus, to make him the Lord of your life, let somebody know that, okay? I'm hanging around here after the service. You can let me know. Let the person know that you came with, but let somebody know that you made that decision so that they can help you know what the next step is. We're having a baptism next Sunday. We would be honored to include you uh, on that baptism. So, um, you know, we have members and we have regular attenders, and, and regular attenders make the decision to commit themselves to our congregation to be part of our church family. And if you'd like to know more about that, man, I would love to visit with you about that, answer any questions you have about that. But John and Janice Wallace have been worshiping with us for some time here, and the Lord has called them to commit themselves to membership, to be a part of our church family. And so John and Janice, where are y'all sitting? Right over here. There they are, waving right there. So give the Lord a hand for John and Janice. 
I'm going to grab them. We're going to go out to the foyer, and you come by and welcome them into our church family. Would you do that before you leave? And then don't forget, stay for Sunday school. If you don't, uh, come back because at noon, 12.05, maybe 12.10, hopefully, uh, we're going to do a groundbreaking, okay? And we want you to be a part of it. So uh, be a part of that special occasion. We always dismiss with prayer. And so, David, would you lead us in that prayer, please? Father, we just know that uh, there is joy in the house of the Lord. And this morning, Lord, we just uh, hope that we've honored you, that we've praised your name in a powerful way. God, we want to worship you continuously in our lives. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for just what this day means in the life of this church moving forward and the vision that you've created and are directing. Lord, we just pray that we will pay attention to all the details along the way. Thank you. Let us be joyful this morning in your name. Amen. Amen.